Because of the global pandemic, the 2020 National Puppetry Conference has been moved online. But to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the conference, the National Puppetry Conference Masterclasses have been open to the public who can buy a ticket and tune in to one or all of them. I talked to Master Puppeteer Ronnie Burkett, who is teaching one of those masterclasses about his thoughts on the National Puppetry Conference and what those puppeteers who tune in can expect from the masterclasses on this special episode of Under the Puppet. You're listening to Saturday Morning Media. And now, back to our show. Welcome to the show that talks to puppeteers about the art and business of puppetry. My name is Grant Pachoco, and this is Under the Puppet. Well, Ronnie Burkett, thank you very much for being here on Under the Puppet. Hey, Grant. So happy to be here. I would love to start by asking a bit about your history with the National Puppetry Conference. When was your first conference? My first conference, um, I'm trying not to make stuff up. I think I've been there six times, um, and I had to miss a couple of years. So I probably went about eight or nine years ago was my first time. And... uh, Pam Arciero had tried to get me there forever. I think she was about to give up on me getting there. Um, And I finally found myself saying yes. Um, A funny story about my going, you know, is is, uh, the first time I left, my ship was packed and I was standing outside waiting to be picked up to be taken to the airport to go. And my partner, who's a civilian, said... uh, so, so what is this? It's some puppet conference thing? And I said, yeah, I really, I really don't want to go do this. <laughs> and then I came back two weeks later, put my luggage down, and it was greeted at the door, and he said, so how was it? And I burst into tears. So uh, <laughs> it, it, was, uh, it was long overdue that I got there, but when I did, I, I, I fell into it head over heels. What do you think was your your biggest takeaway from that? I mean, I know you loved it, but th- your biggest takeaway from that first two weeks? My biggest takeaway was just um, a sense of community. And as Pam often calls it, meeting your tribe. You know, I've certainly been in the tribe for decades, in and out of the tribe. But, you know, Grant, we puppetry by its very nature, even though it's highly collaborative, so much of it because so many of us are independents and and jacks of all trades and we have to do so much of the work ourselves and it's a form of theater where technically none of it exists so you have to build most of it so we so we work in isolation you know we live in our heads and uh to go to this uh campus of the o'neill which is beautiful and to have some time to just be with the tribe. You don't have to worry about making your own meals or anything. And the beach is there. And and, and so it was this kind of um, brigadoon that pops <laughs> up once every year, and then it goes away. So I, I, I wasn't expecting that. I was not expecting, um, I mean, it's, it can also be boot camp, you know, it's, it's because you don't leave campus and you're there the whole time and you don't have to make your own meals. You can just dive in and, and exhaust yourself, which is what happens to pretty much everyone. But it, I think it is that sense of brigadoon of finding this magical place with people who not only do speak your language, but want to speak it. Right, exactly. I, I've only been once officially, and I completely agree with everything you say. Um, mm. it, it really is like a magical place uh, to go check out. Um, you mentioned Pam Arciero, who's the uh, conference's artistic director. Could you talk a bit about her passion for this conference? Oh, my gosh. I, you know, I, I, she is, I call her the headmistress. You know, that's my, that's my little nickname for Pam. Um, and I defer to the headmistress's um, insight and vision all the time, uh, between herself and Jean Marie Kevens, you know, they, they really run the ship. I, I don't know how anyone could organize that with all these different strands and all these different personalities, but Pam has a deep commitment to the exploration of contemporary puppetry. And, um, it's obvious in the artists that she chooses as, uh, guest mentors and guest artists to come, uh, and, and it, it seems boundless. She doesn't seem to wane in her enthusiasm for the possibilities of contemporary puppetry. And uh, and also a great thing about Pam in terms of that, when I say contemporary puppetry, is she has such a deep um, affection for where the conference 
began, who began it. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, you know, there's there's trees planted around um, the O'Neill. There's Margot Rose has a, a tree planted, I believe. George Latshaw has a tree with a little plaque. Uh, one of the theaters is the Rufus and Margot Rose Theater Barn. Now we have the Henson Rehearsal Hall. So there's a great history of puppetry. Just the minute you get there, the O'Neill is seeped in puppetry and exists in a large part because of the efforts uh, of Rufus and Margot Rose at the very, very beginning of the O'Neill, even before the National Puppetry Conference. So, you know, Pam is so aware of tradition, but she's also ready to take that tradition and slap it around and push it into the future. And um, and so that's what I found exciting was seeing so many young theater artists and puppetry artists who wanted to explore puppetry um, in this really safe but challenging environment. I mean, it is relentless, as you know, Grant. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's, not a, it's not an easy holiday, but for me, it's my fate. I, I always call going to the O'Neill as my holiday because I don't actually go on holidays because I tour most of my life. So the last thing I want to do when I get home is pack a suitcase and go somewhere. But going to the O'Neill is kind of my annual holiday, which is ridiculous because I go, 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 go all day. Right. I found even the one time I was there that when I came away, I was exhausted, um, mm. but so full of ideas and so full, to, uh, you know, so full of energy to try and tackle these ideas. Uh, do you feel the same way when you attend? I totally feel the same way. You know, I, I am the first person to say that, that I am not a teacher. And I say that without any self-deprecation. I, I have had extraordinary teachers and mentors and coaches my whole life and career. So I was, I will say I was well trained by extraordinary teachers. So I don't put myself in that role. Um, And it was the beginning of my understanding that it was time for me to start mentoring, I guess. But I think uh, for me personally, uh, that first year, um, I learned quickly that Whatever I was saying as a mentor or a teacher or a strand leader, if you will, if it was coming out of my mouth, I was constantly checking, did I believe that? Was that what I believe right now about puppetry or about the process that we were discussing in that moment? And so every year I come back from the O'Neill having explored in a really personal way um, my ideology and my philosophy of puppetry and turning it back on my own work table when I get home, exhausted, as you say, and looking at it and saying, huh, something came out of my mouth when I was talking to someone or someone said something that made me think something. And so I, I feel that it does expand you. And <laughs> in a very funny way, you know, uh, you know, cults, when they take you off to their camps, you know, feed you a certain diet and they just make you work endlessly and they beat you down until you drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak. Um, and I, I, in a weird way, that's how I feel after the O'Neill. I feel that I'm just so tired um, by choice because I'm certainly not going to miss out on anything while I'm there. So I'm exhausted. And in that exhaustion, I feel that I open up to being less rigid about my own thoughts about puppetry, you know, especially when you're surrounded by other people who are practitioners and doing it in other ways. So for me, that's, that's really the high and the joy of it is, you know, working in isolation or my collaborators are usually theater people who are not puppeteers. So to go and just sit with someone who actually wants to talk about knee joints over lunch (laughs) is thrilling for me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned some of the artists there. Um, who have been some of your favorite artists or, or favorite projects that you've seen in your time at the O'Neill? Oh, boy. I mean, oh, okay. See, I didn't pre-think that one, and I'm racking my brain because there's been so... I mean, it goes the gamut, right? So, you know, um, Jim Krupa is one of the um, uh, masterclass artists this year, and Jim is there at the pre-conference every year. He, I think Jim's uh, MEX class is the number one requested pre-conference class of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so Jim did a show, the Howdy Do show, uh, where in the main conference a few years ago, uh, and I believe he was supposed to be back this year or, or again sometime soon. Um, and 
it was just delightful. And it's not the style of work I work in. You know, it was that um, uh, television Muppet style, but it was a live show and it was pure puppetry. It was just um, this ridiculous, beautiful, funny review. Uh, that was one of my favorites. But then I've also seen pieces that uh, that I don't understand or comprehend that have also blown me away. You know, um, oh, I'm trying to think here, it's killing me. But also, I've seen, you know, in the participant pieces that people just do on their own in their spare time, as you know. So the workshop is going till two in the morning with people building their own personal projects. And you, and it literally is on Saturday morning, one after another, sometimes 40 pieces, five minutes long of get them on, get them off. And, and in those participant pieces over the years, in these fresh ideas that are very short, I've seen glimmers of brilliance you know i don't know if a lot of those people have continued on with that stuff or expanded those ideas but it's that it's that uh embarrassment of riches in a way it's it's so much to see and so much to absorb but aside from from the work that i've seen the number of true friendships that i've made uh, people who are in my life constantly now just because uh aside from the commonality of puppetry or art or the discussion of those two things, which quite frankly would be enough for me because I'm hungry for it all the time. You meet people who actually are your brothers and sisters and uh, people that you actually want to hang out in the pub with and people you want to keep in touch with or go visit outside of the conference. So I've made many, many, many friendships. Jean Marie is one of those. Pam and I have become very close. Jim Godwin and I are practically brothers. You know, um, I don't know if life would have ever put me around Jim Krupa, for example, and and I and 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 I don't know if it's mutual, but there's a big boy crush going on there for me. <laughs> um, and you know, just on and on and on. You know, I Yael Razuli, who's one of the master classes this year, when she was at the O'Neill a couple of years ago as a guest artist, and um, we just ran into each other um, just on the on the on the road and i went over and welcomed her because i'd been there before and i didn't assume she would have any clue who i was and instantly there was a hug and we've been tied ever since so for me that's the o'neill and 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 what's interesting is i see that every year with really young puppeteers you know 19 20 year olds who have met each other online or watched each other's youtube stuff and they communicate um uh, online and through social media and then there's there's a gang of kids who agreed to meet at the o'neill in krupa's mex class one year and 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 seeing that happen every year of young puppeteers meeting friends and i always look at them and think you have no idea you're going to be friends for the rest of your life yeah and because I remember my first Puppeteers of America festival, you know, and Paul Mesner was there and we were, what, 14 or 16 years old. We were teenagers and I know him to this day. So it's so delightful for me to see young people just coming into the craft or their exploration of the craft, meeting one another, having lunch together, hanging out late at night, being whatever you do when you're 19. Um, and, and they're they're going to be lifers. A lot of those people. It's it's fantastic. Yeah, it's 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 the National Puppetry Conference is a magical place. I mean, that's usually how I describe it, and I don't know how you can describe it otherwise. Yeah, you know, there are people in puppetry who give it a bad rap who've never been there too. So I, I heard those whisperings of people going, "Oh, it's elitist," you know, or it's snobby, or it's uh, or, or they use the A word, you know, it's oh, it's too arty, you know, and right. so. I was expecting that. I thought, oh, I better have my intellectual academic cap on. I better, you know, really show up every minute of the day being a puppet philosopher. It's completely not that. I'm, I, I do have deep intellectual and philosophical conversations about puppetry there endlessly, but it's sitting on top of a picnic bench uh, chatting, you know. So um, I... I I, I don't know. I, I partially resisted it for a long time myself, but usually I was booked and I was on tour uh, because I used to uh, tour a lot in June 
uh, to Europe when Europe was a place we could tour to. Um, so I was either unavailable or that mindset of, I've been on the road all year, I don't want to go somewhere else. Um, but like I said, when I finally went, it was like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm so grateful for Pam's tenacity to get me there and that I went because, y- you know, try and keep me away now. <laughs> right. Well, because of the the pandemic, the uh, 2020 National Puppetry Conference has been moved online. And to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the conference, the master classes, of which you are teaching one of them, have been open to the public. uh, And the public can buy a ticket and tune into one or all of them. And um, those master classes start Monday with your master class on design for the puppet theater. Can you tell us a bit about what people can expect from your master class if they tune in? (laughs) Oh, good Lord. I'm going to figure it out (laughs) half an hour before. Uh, No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, online is not how I do things. You know, I, I personally just want everyone to come into the studio and we'll get the books on the table and I'll just talk, right? Um, clearly, I can talk a lot. So uh, I just want to address why design is important in puppetry rather than just sitting down and building a show or building a puppet that uh, at the very least having design gives you a map that uh, helps you on the road to creating a thing. Uh, It also is a really nice reference to have so scale and proportion don't get out of hand. You know, a lot of people when they're sculpting or fabricating, say, the head, puppet heads just naturally grow. That happens to everybody, especially when you're sculpting a head. So having design, either a technical design or a character design, and and I'll discuss the difference between the two, really keeps you, um, you know, at your original vision and seeing it through. Uh, But for me, design is also important if you are collaborating. Design is important if you're uh, pitching, you know, a project. And uh, ours is certainly a very visual uh, form. And having visuals and designs and um, all of that sort of stuff is really advantageous to puppeteers for grants or collaborations or commissions. Uh, It's also, I realize, having a portfolio is incredibly important um, these days because in order to get into some schools or apprenticeship programs, people want to see your work um, as as one of the deciding factors of getting into those programs. So uh, across the board, I think design is something that's not often addressed in puppetry. Um, you know, I had, I had said to Pam and Jean Marie a couple of years ago, I said, I would love to do, you know, we always fantasize dream world where some wealthy patron dies and leaves $80 million to the puppetry <laughs> conference that I'd love to do, uh, you know, middle of the year, two week design course where it's just a design intensive. We're not building puppets at all, but it's all about design. And I, and uh, so I've got a really good challenge uh, for my design master class, you know, which I think um, would be an interesting exercise for people to do on their own. Um, you can't do a lot in an hour. Um, and, and just showing visuals, references, you know, uh, does a material inspire you for an entire look of a show? You know, it does a painting, it does a style of art, does a style of sculpture, you know, uh, does the text indicate. So just how to approach design in puppetry as a, as a conscious, deliberate thing rather than a kind of make it up as you go along form. I, well, I'm super excited. I'll, I will be checking it out for sure. Um, I'd love to, to ask you about... Uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, you like to do things in person, and uh, usually at the conference it is all in person, but this seems like it's a great opportunity for puppeteers around the world, really, to tune in and see what the conference is all about. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I I think my natural uh, curmudgeon would say, ah, oh, it's not going to work. But, but, you know, that said, it's not lost on me that just prior to talking to you, I sent... Uh, some information, a link to something to a young puppeteer in Portugal. I sent uh, other information uh, through private message on Instagram to a young female puppeteer. I think she's in 
Serbia or somewhere, and I sent some product information to a friend in Calgary, Alberta, and that was all in the half hour before you and I talked. The connectivity of the world we live in right now, I think, is not only what's saving us, it's propelling us, you know. Um, Certainly in these times of pandemic and protest, we see how um, advantageous this kind of connectivity and this virtual world has been in organizing and staying in touch so that uh, isolation is not the gnawing thing that will end us. And and so I'm intrigued to see how this works. You see, I mean, I, I know you've seen more of it probably than I have, Grant, you know, people have taken their work online during the pandemic of, of doing shows in their living room, of, of creating work specifically for social media content. So it's undeniable that this is the world we live in right now. And you're right. It's connecting us. It's going to connect a lot more people to the O'Neill this time than just the people who are accepted or can afford to or are physically able to get to Connecticut. So now anyone can log in and and benefit from aspects of the conference. Yeah, I, I'm super excited um, just because, as you said, uh, in, in past years, I would love to go back, but it's always I'm busy. I'm working on something. Um, and so I was super excited uh, that the master classes and stuff would be online because now I can tune in. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and there's some great master classes this year. You know, this this you know I I had to miss last year uh, uh, because I was premiering a show at exactly the time of the O'Neill. So there was actually no way I could physically not do it so or do it. So uh, this year I was excited because I, I was yearning to go back, but also just because of who's doing master classes. You know, I mean Krupa is doing a master class. I, that's worth the price of admission. And Baron de Grognik from Iceland is is doing uh the ABCs of being a successful puppeteer. And if anybody has been a successful puppeteer with a theatrical career, it's certainly Baron. You know, I, I would show up and listen to anything he had to say. And like I mentioned, Yal Razuli talking about her process, um, which I think that kind of deep, personal, intimate exploration that someone wants to share is extraordinary. Uh, the one I really, really am excited about is Fabrizio Montecchi from Italy discussing contemporary shadow work. Uh, like, that's not something I do, Grant, you know, but my favorite puppetry is the stuff I don't do. And mm-hmm. that's that's part of the O'Neill. You know, you go with your toolkit. So there's so many people who go who work Muppet style and have never been exposed to a different kind of theatrical puppetry. And there's people who just want to go make marionettes who suddenly are seeing, you know, um, object theater for the first time. So for me, puppetry, the puppet shows I like to sit and watch are the ones that I would never think of doing. And so the O'Neill masterclasses, it's a pretty great smorgasbord of different viewpoints. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to it. And Ronnie, I just can't thank you enough for, for coming on here and talking about the National Puppetry Conference. And we'll, we'll see you online on Monday. Perfect. Thanks, Grant. Thanks to Ronnie Burkett for being on this episode. For links to Ronnie's website, as well as the National Puppetry Conference, check out the show notes for this episode, episode number 46, over at underthepuppet.com. Many thanks also to Pam R.C. Arrow and the National Puppetry Conference, who provided Under the Puppet with a pass to the masterclasses at this year's conference. I'm looking forward to checking them all out. If you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback about the show, you can call our voicemail line at 818-806-9604 or click the Call the Show button in the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android. You can send feedback via email to underthepuppet at gmail.com or you can connect with the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram by searching for Under the Puppet. Thank you so much for listening. This episode of Under the Puppet featured music by Dan Ring and was edited by Stephen Staver. Under the Puppet is a production of Saturday Morning Media and made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who've gone to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up a monthly pledge for as little as a dollar a month. Patrons get new episodes before they are released, behind the scenes information, and exclusive bonus episodes. If you'd like to support this show and the other fun content from Saturday Morning Media, become a patron. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up your monthly pledge today. You can also tell a friend about the show or leave the show a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. Under the Puppet is copyright 2020 Saturday Morning Media, Grant Pachoco Executive Producer, all rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com 
The new Under the Puppet app is here for iOS and Android, and it is absolutely free. Download it today to get all the episodes of Under the Puppet in one place. Plus, you'll hear new episodes before their release, get exclusive bonus episodes, and more. Just search for Under the Puppet in the Apple App Store for iOS or on Google Play. You can also visit SaturdayMorningMedia.com forward slash apps for direct links. The free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android. Download it today. You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.